the main historical and the head of collections, uh, but I'm also the project director for an initiative we have at Maine Historical Society called Beyond Borders, which is the mapping of Maine and the Northeast boundary, which is supported through the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Humanities and Reference Resources grant that MHS was awarded in the spring of 2020. And that grant specifically focuses on digitizing and providing full text online access to three of MHS's most significant manuscript collections, uh, including the Pajebscot Proprietors, the Kennebec Proprietors, and the Barclay Collection, which we locally call the Northeast Boundary Collection. And the first of which, the Pajebscot Proprietors, is really the precipitous for today's Historians Forum, which is one of two parts. We have another forum coming up in early August that I'm sure Ian, uh, our forum coordinator and host, will speak to about the Pajebscot Proprietors, uh, which is a, or was, a uh, Massachusetts-based land holding, a land speculation company aimed at uh, acquiring uh, and encouraging settlement on land um, in what is now known as sort of the Greater Brunswick area. So encouraging the settlement of Wabanaki homeland um, in the greater area, including Harpswell, Topsum, uh, Lewiston, Minot, Poland areas that one wouldn't consider Greater Brunswick today, but are for the purposes of the proprietors. So the National Endowment for the Humanities grant um, is a two and a half year project that we are maybe about a little less than a little over a year into uh, and will eventually result in a main memory network portal to access these collections. Part of that work includes the transcription of these manuscript pages, which is about 20,000 pages of manuscript material through a crowdsourcing platform uh, hosted by Zooniverse, which is also support, supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, we'd encourage you, if you have an interest in this topic, um, Ulster Scots or broader Pajevskot proprietors or Anglo-Indigenous relationships and lots of other aspects of Maine history, uh, you can be um, a volunteer to help transcribe those materials. And you can find that information on our website at mainhistory.org or just by googling uh, Zooniverse Maine Historical Society. So it's a really exciting project and we're uh, thankful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support on this at a perfectly timed sort of in the in the height of the pandemic. I would also like to say that this project provides uh, ample opportunity to coordinate with Indigenous scholars, historians, and tribal representatives to help contextualize and interpret these materials with diverse voices, and that we recognize the sovereignty of the Wabanaki people, and that Maine, what is now known as Maine, is and continues to be Wabanaki, Wabanaki homeland. So I'd like to thank um, the community, Indigenous communities for their support and um, uh, and scholarship through through this endeavor. So with that, thank you. Um, I thank both to uh, Professor Griffin and Professor Breen for joining us. It's very exciting to be able to have uh, nationally recognized scholars on this topic. I think that's one of the um, optimum things that the Zoom platform provides is to get uh, these, this, this really great perspectives. And of course, to uh, Ian Saxine, uh, our Historians Forum coordinator, and to the Williams family for their continued support of the Historians Annual Historians Forum. Thank you very much, and I'll turn that over to Ian. Thanks so much, Jamie. And thanks to everybody for uh, everybody in the audience for uh, being with us today. Uh, also, uh, thanks so much to Kathleen Newman, our manager of education and uh, public programs for being our, our tech coordinator today. Thank you so much to Henry Chiazzo for organizing and digitizing so many of the images that made this program possible. Uh, and thank you to the donors and members of the Maine Historical Society uh, whose support makes all this possible. Uh, so thanks to all. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks to our two distinguished panelists, uh, Patrick Griffin and Tim Breen. I'm going to introduce them to you both, uh, to you all now. So Pat Griffin is a professor of history, as well as the director of the Institute for Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He got his PhD in history at Northwestern University, something that we have in common. Uh, Griffin's books include America's Revolution, 
American Leviathan, Empire Nation and Revolutionary Frontier. Um, and first and far from least, uh, his book, The People With No Name, Ireland's Ulster Scots, America's Scots Irish, and the creation of a British Atlantic world. Uh, and throughout his career, uh, Griffin's scholarship has interrogated how different uh, sets of ordinary people have shaped and were shaped by transatlantic imperial and often revolutionary forces. T.H. Breen is the William Smith Professor of, Hist of American History Emeritus at Northwestern University. He's had a hand in creating not one, but two new institutes of learning at Northwestern, the Kaplan Center for the Humanities and the Chabria Center for Historical Studies. A complete list of his awards, fellowships, and invited positions uh, would eat up a scandalous portion of our morning. Uh, he currently holds the James Marsh Professorship at large uh, at the University of Vermont. Uh, he's written many books, uh, Marketplace of Revolution, How Consumer Politics Shaped American Independence stands out as my favorite for its creative look at material culture and the actions of ordinary people to argue that in terms of the American Revolution, uh, stuff uh, was the stuff of politics and ideas. Uh, and Tim's more recent books have turned to investigating how hundreds of thousands of ordinary people went about the work of making an American revolution in their communities. A number of these people were Ulster Scots or descended from them, and Tim has paid them particular attention in his work. Both Patrick and I were graduate students of Tim's, uh, making this a reunion of sorts. I should add this was not by any stretch at the same time. Uh, Patrick was an earlier star student, uh, and I was uh, the caboose, the final student at the end, uh, when Patrick was already well established at Notre Dame. Uh, having learned uh, so much, uh, I look forward to asking them both, so what, uh, and to elaborate on their portable arguments. Welcome to them both. All Thanks. Right. Thanks, Ian. And I should also add, Tim, thank you. Tim turned me to the uh, Pajewska Proprietors Papers back in 2009. He said, I think you should go check them out. Uh, and I've spent a career since then, uh, since then uh, with these documents. All right. So uh, to begin with, the Ulster Scots, also known as the Scots-Irish or Scotch-Irish, uh, any way you slice it, uh, both parts of the name refer to key aspects of history and identity. So I thought we'd take a few minutes to talk about some of the origins of these identities. And so uh, Patrick, uh, what did the Scots portion of Ulster Scots mean when we call these people Ulster Scots? Uh, where were these people from and what experiences, if they were indeed Scottish, shaped their identity? All right. Well, Ian, again, thank you so much for having me. And it's always a joy to be doing anything with Tim. Um, so uh, this is a great treat for me. And uh, it's wonderful work that you're doing here. So thank you. Uh, all right. Let me give you kind of maybe the simple answer first, then I'm going to try to confuse you. All right. So the simple answer is uh, these people that we know as Ulster Scots, later going to be the so-called Scots-Irish or Scotch-Irish, mm -hmm. are originally coming from border areas in Scotland. So lowland Scotland, largely most from the southeast, but some also from the southwest. And if we just try to think in terms of their identity, we'd say, well, that's pretty simple. They find themselves, if you will, kind of caught between two different peoples. They have the English to the south. And to the north, they have the Scottish Highlanders, and they would consider themselves very different than the Scottish Highlanders. So imagine, if you will, like an in-between people who are kind of caught between these two other distinct people that have definable identities in so many ways. And these are the people that are going to make their way over to Ireland, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, that's a simple story, right? Uh, and you can kind of just say, oh, how this is going to add up to who they are in America. That's really simple to see, caught between these two. All right, but let's talk about the other story that's shrouded in myth that I think is much, much more interesting. And I'll tell you a little story just about one of the first, the earliest uses of the term Scotch-Irish, right? So that's an American term for the most part. But the, one of the first people to use was actually Queen Elizabeth when she talked about these people, these Scotch-Irish people. But she's not referring to the people that I just talked about now. She was talking about Highlanders 
who were li linked to Irish Gales in the north of Ireland. And these people consider themselves one and the same. And she says, we have to watch out for these kind of Scotch Irish people who live up in these areas. And that's like kind of a clue to the sort of fluidity we're talking about that I think really defined these people. There was constant movement and intercourse between Scotland and between the north of Ireland from the Middle Ages on. Indeed, the word Scotland itself, um, the earliest Scots were just a band of Irish renegades who came over and invaded that place from Ireland and established the first kingdom of Scotland. And this movement was continual between these people. And so the moment that we start talking about identities and names, we have to realize that we're in sort of like a foggy, misty world, you know, something that we'll be getting into here as we go uh, through you know, the rest of the program. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good point that there is a lot of the story is, is shrouded in this myth and, and emotion. Yeah. So, so we have, okay, so these people are from the, the, the Scottish lowlands, uh, right. but Ulster is in Ireland. So mm -hmm. when and why did these folks go there? Um, and what, how did their experience in Ireland uh, end up shaping their identity? Well, this is definitely going to be more proximate to the American story. And so... Um, how did they get over to Ireland and why did they get over to Ireland? And so the, the answer is, is it goes back to what I just talked about with Queen Elizabeth and Scotch-Irish. And so that, that was deemed to be one of the great threats of the English state was the union of these kind of Scottish Highlanders and these Irish Catholics in the north of Ireland. And so then English uh, leaders like James VI and I, King, James VI, King of Scotland, who became James I of England, is going to establish what we call plantation policies. And that is the idea, how do you break the link between Scottish Highlanders and the Irish who are living in the north? And that was the most hardcore Catholic place in Ireland was the northern part of Ireland. And he decided, well, the easiest way was just to kind of create a wedge between the Highlanders and the Irish and clear out the Irish. And at the same time, provide opportunities because of demographic growth in England for people to move over. And some of the people he realized, again, that were demographically stressed at the time were some of these lowland Scots. And so then they were invited as part of plantation schemes to come over and establish themselves in this area so they could do some of the work of the English state in securing that state and weakening Catholic Irish identity. And at the same time, as I say, breaking that bond between Irish Catholics and Highlanders who were living in Scotland. And so they come over there as part of that. That's one movement there. You're going to find Cromwellian soldiers also. Uh, some of them Scots are also going to add to that. And then in the 1690s, there's going to be a famine in some of the parts of Scotland, and thousands of these people are going to head over to Ireland. So Ireland is a place of opportunity for these people. And at the same time, it's also strategically important for the English to try to, if you will, break that bond between the, between the Highland Scots and between the Irish and weaken the Irish Catholic, uh, weaken Irish Catholics in the north of Ireland. These people were the perfect shock troops to do that. And that's going to create, if you will, that kind of like important sense of their mythic identity, that they're embattled people, they're established and set to go over and to kind of do some of the dirty work of the state. That's going to be one of the things that they're going to kind of pride themselves on being. And again, a people trapped between different worlds. On the one hand, they're coming over to Scotland. They're, they're coming over to Ireland. They are certainly not members of the established church, something we'll probably get into. But at the same time, they're not Irish Catholics. So they're these in-between people. And this becomes sort of an important aspect of their identity, too. Uh, OK. Well, so that uh, mention of the of the hereafter and the politics of church here, I think this is a good transition uh, to go. So, uh, so we now have this sort of geopolitical sense of what they're doing in Ireland. You mentioned they're Presbyterian. So, uh, Tim, I know you have some some thoughts on on, on, on Presbyterianism and such. And so, uh, if we could zoom out a smidge for uh, for our audience members who might think, well, all right, I know Presbyterians. I guess they're you know. Protestant or something like that. And so for some modern people, they might say, well, they're all, they're all Protestants, so what's the big deal? So could you give us, uh, what did it strictly speaking mean to be a Presbyterian in the, in the 17th century, into the, into the 18th century when we're talking about? Sure, Ian, I, I can talk about it. Um, if I may, I, I'd like to um, reinforce 
something that Patrick said, because I think it will echo in our um, discussion all morning. And that is um, when the Scot Scots uh, were in Scotland, as he said, it caught in the middle, there was also economic pressure. Sir Thomas More, you know, very famous uh, quotation said that uh, the improvers, people that uh, came up and uh, uh, brought uh, uh, wool and sheep, he said that Scotland was a place where the sheep ate the people. And what he meant was that there had been a traditional um, a force in Scotland of uh, looking out for one another. It was a hierarchical, but they were, but every 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 group had a tack man who was who reported to the improving laird and so on. But that was that was disturbed. What what you get and what Patrick is saying, I think, is that there's a there's a sense of victimization from these people and betrayal. That and the, and there's very long memories, but it keeps repeating itself in in Ireland, and then to some extent when they get to Maine and New Hampshire, it's uh, it's it's almost as if they feel uh, that their history is replaying. But uh, getting to the Presbyterian, these these are well, these are hard nosed Presbyterians who um, um, uh, subscribe to the Westminster Confession as it is, which is uh, basically the the, the uh, founding creed of the uh, Presbyterian Church, it goes back to Knox and, uh, and others and uh, was reinforced during the English Civil Wars when Scotland uh, came down and um, basically throughout uh, uh, many of the English that were associated with uh, the Stuarts. Um, Presbyterian has two, two, two faces, one theological and one in terms of church government. The uh, theological one is one that I think your viewers today will find uh, strange and maybe even repellent, but it was a, a very, very uh, well-developed sense of uh, sin and uh, your responsibility. It's, a, it's, a, it's based on, 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 on Calvinistic uh, doctrines of work and responsibility um, uh, of uh, uh, leading a life um, of, of the gospel. It's no accident in that um, historians of literacy have found that lowland Scotland uh, in the early modern period was one of the most literate places in the world as far as ordinary people. And, uh, but uh, strangely, they found that this literary, literacy did not include writing, it only meant reading and so they, they historians poked around it was because the scots really were serious about reading the good book the scriptures themselves and making their own interpretation it's a it's a it's a strong interpersonal sense of faith not not exactly tolerant but very intense the polity element and it played out a little bit when they got to new england is unlike the congregational churches, which allow each congregation to be a separate group uh, in charge of hiring their own ministers. Um, the Presbyterians have a synod in which uh, oversees the separate churches, and um, the churches have a kind of representation in the synod. But the Presbyterians were very, very eager to dis, uh, uh, distance themselves from the Church of England and the Episcopal Church, which they felt was authoritarian. Obviously, the people had very little choice over the bishops and, and other figures. Now, why is this important? It's because all during the, the colonial period and even into the revolution, the Presbyterians claimed that their system of government, of, of a kind of representation, was uh, the most Republican form of church organization, that they that they, they were able to understand the revolutionary ferment than any other Christian sect in, in America. Uh, and, but it was their basis of uh, church government that made them say that. Okay, thanks. Um, so, and if you could just expand, uh, or rather, so Congregationalists, most of our audience might be more familiar with them as uh, Puritans. 
Mm -hmm. uh, right. And so uh, in terms of so when the Presbyterians dealt with, uh, with, with the Puritans, so you're suggesting they would have theologically had a lot in common. They just had different ideas about organizing their their uh, their church communities then would, would have been the major point of difference. Yes. Um, uh, from the very earliest times, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Ulster Scots in America were able to pretty much make their peace with, uh, other, with the Congregationalists. Look, there was always uh, friction among churches in those days. Uh, the biggest issue among the Presbyterians that came to northern New England was um, uh, dissent within their within their own uh, own churches, uh, ministers that uh, they didn't like, and there would be oftentimes uh, huge battles. But that was not unusual among the con Congregationalists. What the Ulster Irish in America couldn't tolerate and really, really did, was um, uh, in, in states like uh, New Hampshire, where the Church of England was established, uh, they, 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 did not, uh, they did not take any kindly to external authorities in their churches which they, over which they had not voiced uh, their opinions. It was, in other words, um, the, in, 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 the, the theology all theologies in New England, shall we say, tempered over time a, a, a bit and became less what you might say Puritan. But what didn't change was the uh, structure of church government. Oh, thanks. So one final aspect I'll ask you, and that'll be a good transition then to, to talk sort of ethnicity and belonging with, with Patrick. But Tim, so thinking about, so as a Presbyterian, in some ways, being a Presbyterian might serve as kind of a ticket to belonging in this British imperial world. Uh, and in some ways, being a Presbyterian uh, invited exclusion or, or persecution, right? And so in this ways, uh, you know, as, as Patrick in particular has, has ably written, uh, there's, there's contradictory elements of this identity. So in what ways does being Presbyterian give these people kind of an in? And in what way does it, it again invite uh, persecution? Well, that's that's a that's a very hard question. When the first um, Scots Irish arrived in Maine, New Hampshire, and originally in some uh, in 1720 in in, in uh, Boston, they did feel discriminated against, and there's a lot of records about. Uh, uh, f feeling uh, as unwelcome, which uh, frankly came as a bit of a surprise to some of them because I suspect they felt that they had a common Calvinist roots and there'd be a, a, you know, happy times. What led to the exclusion and the marginalization of the Scots-Irish in the early 17th century uh, was um, their language, their, their, their fierce uh, communitarianism, um, their diet, which we can discuss later, but because they introduced this strange vegetable called potatoes, uh, which uh, the people in Massachusetts didn't know uh, if you should eat a crop that grew, in, grew roots, you ate the roots, that didn't seem proper. Um, so I would think that Presbyterianism was one, uh, one factor, but I would say not the key factor that led to their marginalization in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, that's a good point. Although perhaps we should note, at least they weren't Catholic, which for well, yeah. the 18th century British Empire was sort of the baseline of, of, of inclusion. Yeah. Um, I, I might say, Ian, and, and you're right, is that very early from the first arrival, the, the governor of Massachusetts that at that time was Governor Shute. And he saw these new arrivals in the same way that I think Queen Elizabeth saw them in Scotland as good, good people to serve as the warriors of the frontier. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they weren't fit for polite society, you know, in the, in the, the, the uh, receptions at Harvard, but my goodness, they might be really great at, at um, protecting Massachusetts from the indigenous peoples. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, uh, 
uh, the 18th century is where we're going to be be focusing on and where we're turning. And so by the time the Ulster Scots migration really picks up to North America in the 18th century, several hundred thousand of these people, uh, they were subjects in a British empire. And so scholars tend to talk about the 18th century British empire as a different phenomenon than an earlier English one. Um, and so just for in a, you know, in a way to, to make sure that we're all on the same page here, what are historians talking about, uh, Patrick, when they talk about a British as opposed to an English empire? And maybe are we exaggerating the differences here or does this really make a difference? No, I think it's actually a good shorthand that really does make a difference in matters. And so the, the simple answer again is like when we think about the, the English empire, we're thinking about one of the movement largely of English men and women to places in the new world. And that new world then was kind of one that was dominated by the English who lived in these various places all the way from the Caribbean and the places that we know of in kind of New England, of course, in the Chesapeake, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back to England. So it's a world that's kind of centered in London that's growing demographically, that is kind of like casting these various peoples out around this whole broader world. And in the 18th century, that changes. And we use the term British largely because in 1707, Scotland and England are gonna be yoked together in an active union. They're gonna be both unified. And then we can talk about kind of a, a state that is British, not simply English and Scottish, that British identity is incorporates these and also to a certain extent incorporates the Irish into it, even though kind of with greater difficulty. But the, that corresponds to a dramatic change in the broader Atlantic world of which the Ulster Scots are kind of important players. And that has to do because of the movement of people and goods and ideas. This English world now is one that becomes much, much more dynamic. In terms of the peopling, it's gonna be people from the margins that are gonna be the ones that are largely doing the moving. So the 17th century, as I said, was kind of a movement of English for the most part. The 18th century is going to be people from the margins. And so this is when, of course, Germans are going to start migrating over, when these people from Ireland are going to start migrating over, when Highlanders are going to start migrating over beginning in the 1750s. Most importantly, uh, it's going to be Africans coming over uh, as, as, as the enslaved are going to be moving over as well. And of course, this is going to create a, a coercive, a uh, terrible world in some regards, but also a world that is extraordinarily dynamic um, and one that is definably different than it had been before. And in many ways, these people coming over from Ireland are sort of like the poster children for that world. They're people from the margins who are kind of moving over to America and they are the people who are not only kind of um, uh, reacting to the changes in this world, but they're actually helping this world come into being. So the 18th century, is dynamically different, dramatically different, I should say, from the 17th century in that regard. Okay. Um, and so just, Tim, would you, uh, would you prefer, would you like to add or quibble and say there in fact is not a difference? Uh, scholars have, have disagreed on this. No, no, I wouldn't quibble Wonderful. at all with uh, a person. Sorry, poor with... choice of words. You're not a quibbler, of course. Yeah, I well, saw, I mean, I'm sorry, of course. You, you, you run against an expert at your there own peril. There we go, there we go. Um, but um, there was a, a major change in that the uh, British Empire um, solidified uh, the lines of authority and centralized the authority much, much more than it had been in the 17th century. 17th century, English settlements often were private, commercial, and whatnot. And 18th century is the story of, of, of an empire with uh, supported by um, a state. And with that came uh, a really intense and bitter rivalry uh, from Louis XIV right up to the uh, end of the century that, against France. And the reason that this is important is that the Ulster, the Scots-Irish in America, um, not only were uh, seen uh, by some uh, British as protecting uh, the established settlements from the indigenous people, but more, if you read the histories of the Scots-Irish uh, in your area, um, they took great pride in being um, the, uh, the strike force against the French in Canada. Um, and and uh, um, to some extent, um, their senses, later senses of betrayal by the British uh, often were accompanied by stories about how, 
how they had served so how they had served the empire so loyally and fiercely during the Seven Years' uh, War. Thank you, um, Patrick. So that we can get a sense of the a, a little bit of the scope here. Uh, when did the uh, the big wave of Ulster Scots migration uh, occur? Uh, and then roughly how many people are we are we talking about and, and where did they go? Okay, well, let me confuse you a little bit more. Um, and this goes back to some of the things that Tim was saying. I love, by the way, that he says that these people are almost playing a tape in their head about how the past was being relived over and over and over again. And that certainly is going to be one of the folk memories that can revive from time to time will be a certain important element of their identity as that identity becomes full blown in America. But before this, the time those things again were very, very fluid. And when we talk about the so-called Ulster Scots, it's important to remember that this is the kind of an amalgamation of different kinds of people. There are some Highlanders that are coming over as well. There are Irish Catholics that are coming over as well. And so that you actually find that the communities that many of these people are living in are an amalgamation of different sort of Irish groups and other people from Scotland, some other people from the margins of this broader dynamic world that we were just talking about are kind of settled in the same area. But with time anyway, they start congealing around a new kind of identity. In the 18th century, for the most part, they called themselves Irish. The term Scotch-Irish was not known, and they certainly did not call themselves Ulster Scots. Ulster Scots is the term that we use in Ireland, but it's not a term that would have been used in the 18th century. And the term Scotch-Irish is a 19th century American term that really comes into vogue in the 18 teens and 1820s, largely because of the movement of Irish Catholics over at that time, but also because Irishness was considered to be politically radical. And so they try to disassociate themselves from that. So the term Scotch-Irish is more or less kind of invented at that particular period of time. And it ties into exactly those patterns and trends that Tim was talking about when it comes to kind of reviving who we are in the past. All right, so, but to get to your question, all right, all of that confusing stuff aside, uh, historians have debated a long time about these kinds of numbers, and we have every number from everywhere from low point to 300,000, the high point to like 30,000, low point to 300,000, the high point. We're probably talking about 200,000, 150 to 200,000 people who are coming over between 1717 and coming over between 1775. So there is a lot of debate. Um, uh, but that number, 150 to 200, is probably the most reliable. To our ears, anyway, us moderns, we tend to think, oh, that's not that big. But you have to understand, this is the largest non-African migration of human beings across the Atlantic to the North American colonies in the 18th century. So by 18th century terms, this is a massive displacement and movement of people. Where are they going to go? Well, Tim had mentioned, of course, that some are going to go to New England, where they're expecting a hearty welcome, which they don't receive because even though the Congregationalists, they were fellow Calvinist travelers, they didn't lay look down upon these Irish Presbyterians coming over. Um, most of them are actually gonna to go to the middle colonies. And we think about the Ellis Island of the 18th century is gonna be a place like really Philadelphia and the little mm -hmm. port of Newcastle in what is Delaware now. These are the places that many are going to alight to, but then after time, with time, as we get to the 1750s, but particularly after the Seven Years' War, is going to be places further south they're going to be moving to as well. So the vast majority are coming into the middle colonies, but it's a dispersal, more or less kind of across up and down the colonies at the time with a focus on the middle. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought that up about the numbers and the scale. One thing that I think uh, my students are always surprised by is, you know, Boston is the biggest city in the in the American colony in the, the British colonies in North America until close to the American Revolutionary War. And it's in the 18th century, it's between 12 and 15,000 people for many of those years. And people think, oh, Boston, this is a big city. So if you've got 10 times that coming in, uh, we're talking about, you know, that's huge. So if you're if you're getting modern scales, you'd be looking at, oh, okay, more than 8 million people coming into a, a given area. To be yeah, and that was one of the things, certainly with the Bostonians. So you have all these Irish that are coming over early on. And one of the earliest sets of waves, Irish migration occurs in waves, you know, demographic waves that are occurring. Mm -hmm. And at first they're saying, oh my God, all these Irish coming over. It wasn't vast numbers that were coming over into Boston, but they felt themselves overwhelmed in Pennsylvania, especially in like 1729 was a peak of migration because of like uh, big, big problems over in Ireland, economic problems for the most part. They were pushed over by economic issues. 
uh, people were commenting all the time about, oh my God, we're going to be swallowed alive by all of these Irish that are coming over here. Again, not saying Scotch Irish, all of these Irish that are coming over. And embedded in that term was all of those old stereotypes about the Irish. So these people, even though most of them were not Catholic, maybe up to a third of them were, maybe most of them were not Catholic, they were still kind of, if you will, bundled together as the Irish. That's a good point. There's uh, the records of Jonathan Belcher the uh, governor of Massachusetts for 10 years in the 1730s. He's constantly referring to these people as bog trotters, children of Rome, uh, our Irish friends, you know, sarcastically uh, and all the rest. And so even though, yeah, it seems like I'm thinking like, yeah, they're like closet Catholics all over the place here because he's very fixated on them. They must be, they must be. Uh, okay, so thank you for that uh, perspective. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a few documents and the audience is going to be able to see it, uh, see them as well. And I, uh, I hope that our, our distinguished guests can, can perhaps uh, uh, help us uh, illuminate a few of these. So I'm going to share my screen. So the first, uh, all right, here we go. So I've got, got a map here from our, uh, from our collections. Uh, and this is uh, made by Cyprian Southwick. Uh, he was a, a, a captain who, uh, who charted uh, among a lot of the, the Northeastern American shoreline in the early 18th century. And so this is the harbor of Casco Bay, uh, circa 1720. And uh, he, he plots out some of the, so Casco Bay, for those of you from away, that is the, the big bay that includes uh, Portland, uh, now Portland, Maine. Uh, as well as uh, some of the other the communities uh, up, up and close uh, up to the near the mouth of the Kennebec River, where uh, where the Pachevsky proprietors claimed. And so, if you look at the roughly the sort of the two o'clock uh, station here on the map, here we have. Uh, I'm sorry, no. Uh, let me find them. Uh, one of the few references to here we go. Yes, uh, one of the few references to the Irish in uh, early 18th century Maine that we actually have uh, in terms of telling us where they are. And so there's a, a dot on this map here that's that says Fort George and below it, it says Irish, new settlement. Uh, and that, uh, that is uh, one of the only records that historians have for indicating where uh, the town of Cork was planted. Uh, and it was, uh, it was plotted by a, a recruiter named Robert Temple uh, who uh, he encountered some Irish that had been uh, that had landed elsewhere in the colonies, and he said, "You know what? I'm going to send them up to up to Maine." He was a uh, he was a member of the Clark and Lake proprietors, who are equally shadowy, and so now we have double shadow for here. Uh, the Irish didn't leave very many records, and the Clark and Lake proprietors, uh, all of their records were kept in uh, Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson's house. Uh, in, seven, in the 1760s, when a certain civil disturbance uh, destroyed the house and their records. And so they're the great sort of lost, uh, lost company as well. Um, so we have here a very early depiction of this Irish town of Cork. Uh, but what I wanted to, to, to ask you good folks was when you are working with maps like this uh, in your own works, Okay, uh, scholars use maps for all kinds of things. What are some of the things that you're looking for in a given map? Because many people would say, well, this is great. It's a map, uh, it's gonna tell me where things are. Uh, okay, next, uh, let, let's turn the page. Uh, but you've, you've been around the block a few times, so to speak. So when you're all looking right. at a map like this, what questions do you ask, Tim? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, maps are just wonderful uh, documents that you'd have to have some skill to interpret, but uh, they're wonderful. I might say that this particular map and this particular date is um, uh, one of the key moments in the American uh, narrative of the Scots-Irish in that 1720, uh, as you say, a large group was landed. It was not, and I'm hard to say, I'm sad to say, it was not a happy experience for these people uh, because, um, uh, peculiarly, they found uh, Maine pretty rocky and a little bit cold. Um, 
and um, they, they, they claimed in uh, their petitions to the Massachusetts governor that they were uh, starving. And in fact, indeed, um, the Massachusetts government did send uh, some emergency supplies up to Costco Bay to um, help the, help these people, um, you know, not not to perish uh, immediately. And many of these, uh, if I, you know, you can correct me, you know the records, but um, quite quite a few of these original Maine Scots Irish uh, left, went down towards Massachusetts, and then up back into New Hampshire um, um, as they were trying to find not only uh, land that they could claim or hold legally uh, against counterclaims, but also was a little bit arable. But uh, I always look at the names, like you, you, that's a good way, the local names, some of them have died out. And also um, in not this map, but many, many early maps, there's what they call the cartouche. That's the here, the harbor of Casco Bay. But you'll find in uh, quite a few maps of New England and certainly in the middle colonies, um, uh, designs that are uh, social documents in Virginia, for instance. Um, that is one of the few depictions that we have of enslaved people packing tobacco into, into ships. And the only reason we have that is their decorative, de decorative elements on uh, rare maps. That's a really good point. Uh, and I'm going to ask Patrick uh, if he, as well, but just to, to one brief aside, a few folks have been very curious about, well, uh, some, some folks in the audience might know that there is the, as it's known, the, the town of Cork. Sometimes it's called in one of the scholarships, the lost town of Cork. Nobody knows where it was. And so by looking at this map, can we tell where it was? And the answer is, eh, uh, not, not exactly. Because as, as, uh, as Pat and Tim are, are, are well aware, uh, oftentimes these early modern maps uh, it's not like people had satellites or arc GIS or anything like that. So they're more suggestions or sometimes artistic depictions than they are kind of X marks the spot for locations. And so all we know from this map is that we have here uh, near the near Fort George, uh, there was this uh, new Irish settlement that was indicated on the map here. Uh, but we don't we, we don't fully know where on the uh, on the on the shoreline on this area it was. Uh, we know that it's near Brunswick Town that's mapped out on the map here. We know that it's you know uh, near the, the branch of the Andrus Crogan River, uh, but we have this map is not uh, comprehensive. There were things that uh, Southwick no doubt missed. Uh, there might have been things that uh, perhaps he wanted to exaggerate, depending on if we're asking who's paying him. Right or what what the purpose of this map is, and so there are some maps of Maine that are very explicitly uh, paid for by companies to exaggerate their own presence on a given on a given place. Uh, and uh, the, in uh, I highly encourage interested folks to check it out. There's a, a series known as the Johnson maps uh, from the 1750s when the Pajewska proprietors and their rivals the 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 Kennebec proprietors were, were dueling over stretches of land on the Kennebec. They both hired the same guy to make maps for them. And he made very different maps. And then they exchanged in this war of pamphlets saying, well, that map is obviously made by a blind man because you can see here that the that surveys are all wrong and this, this map is totally wrong. And Johnson did both because they paid him for it. So what's the real, which one's the real map? Eh, you know, it depends, depends who you ask. Uh, uh, Ian, Ian, I might um, just just as an aside say that um, one of the er early maps of the coast of Maine was um, made by uh, Captain John Smith of uh, yes. Virginia fame. Uh, he was then had the exalted title of uh, cap uh, uh, Captain of New England or Commander of New England. But it's interesting because his map actually is is fairly accurate. He was, mm -hmm. he was good. And he did something else. He went ashore oftentimes and asked uh, indigenous peoples or whoever he found, what, what the hell do you call this place? And the survival of Native American names along the coast of Maine owes a great deal to Captain John Smith's 
uh, honest map making. That's a good point. And some of these, some of these map makers and some of these recorders, you know, they just wanted to, in the sort of fashion, you know, just the facts, ma'am, kind of thing, and they wanted to see what was there. But uh, there's also, and maybe Patrick, uh, I know this isn't directly Scots Irish, but you might speak to this as a good early modernist, right? People in the, especially Europeans in like the 17th and 18th centuries, sometimes they would depict things that, well, everybody knows the following. And so any kind of uh, depiction of it, whether it's on a map or an art or whatever, should express this fact that everybody knows. Have you encountered this in your scholarship or your teaching? In a, oh, in yeah, a, absolutely. And let me just return to uh, a word that you use, you use the word, uh, the purpose, the purpose for which the map is created. And that's kind of an important thing about all these maps to keep in mind, um, is that they're always done for a reason. And so maps are not just a way for you to kind of find your way around kind of a geographic space, but power is usually embedded in them. All sorts of cultural assumptions are embedded upon them. Maps are about how we take advantage of certain places or their opportunities. Are there dangers that are involved? These are all the things we as historians are looking at when we're trying to understand a map. We're trying to get into the mind of the people who are looking at them and the mind of the people who are creating them to appreciate kind of the things that we as historians should take away from them. Um, this map in particular is really interesting in a number of ways too, because of course it's a chart. That's the important thing. So it's not just kind of the land is kind of less important than what are kind of some of the dangers and what are the safe ports that are involved in finding your way and moving through this space. And so this is one, now we as historians are gonna know, it's probably more apt to be geographically sound than other kinds of maps, particularly when we're talking about land division and the like, because this is largely for mariners to make sure that they don't run that, run that ship aground. So that's why you have the fathoms and everything like that. That's why you have the compass rows in the middle of the map uh, in order to help them situate themselves with the compass. And so that's an important thing. There's another, something else I wanted to say about the kind of the port of Cork. You know, as we know, the vast majority of these people coming over, as, as, as Tim was just saying, when they're leaving between 1717 and 1720, most of the people that are coming from this area are indeed from Ulster, from the northern part of, of Ireland. Most of them happen to be Presbyterian. That's going to be the first movement that we're going to find of a lot of these people over to America in general. And they definitely do have a difficult time of it early on. But again, when they are referred to by authorities, they're talked about as being Irish. That's why it's the Irish settlement at the time. But Cork is a very interesting one because Cork is, of course, on the other side of the country, the far southwest of the country. But of all of the ports and all of the towns in Ireland in the 17th century, Cork was by far the most Atlantically oriented. This was the place, the chief provisioning stage for the Caribbean. Uh, for the British in the 17th century, and you find there was going to be a massive movement of these people to places like Montserrat and Barbados before these plans, places transitioned over to chattel slavery for sugar production. It's largely going to be the Irish who are going to be settling on these islands. And so beef, butter, all these kinds of things are leaving the port of Cork, and Cork was a place that was kind of oriented toward the Atlantic. So when you think about a name, at this case, I don't know the specifics here, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with anything from, say, a people settling from Cork. These people wouldn't have been from Cork, but it just ties this place back into kind of an Ireland that is already kind of tied into the Atlantic. That's a really good point. And I'm gonna show another map, but that, speaking of names, uh, one other thing we might, the audience might note for this map is uh, it looks like Southwick either spoke with people on the shore or he had, he had uh, people in his network because he has names of people on the shore here. So this isn't just, as, as Patrick well points out, a chart. He also notes here that Casco Fort, uh, built by Colonel uh, Runnimer here, right? Uh, and that Andros Field. And so he's naming who built stuff, uh, whose certain estates are, whose, whose houses are in certain particular prominent ones, right? And so this is not just about locations, but this is very much about credit and places and sort of, you know, uh, and so he clearly, probably anyway, uh, he must have spent some time here or something else. All right. Uh, speaking to Patrick's point about power, I just wanted to show this other map really uh, quickly. Uh, this is a, a map of the Kennebec River. So we have uh, Casco Bay would be down past the sort of bottom left part of this map. So Merry Meeting Bay 
is the the little bay that that empties into 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 Casco, uh, and then it is a line north and south. Uh, but it's it's known as it was it was surveyed in 1719 1720 uh, by Joseph Heath, um, and so uh, and he he very much was was working for the Pajepska proprietors. Uh, but it's a map that ends at Norwich Walk Fort, which was a major uh, community of the Wabanakis. And so he's got an entire narrative paragraph describing the size and layout of the largest neighboring Wabanaki community that the company and that the British colonizers had to be aware of. Uh, and it's something that uh, the scholars have used as, a, a, uh, as one of the snapshots of, of the uh, the community of Norwich Walk around this time. It even lays out some planting fields and things like that. Uh, but it's very much written out uh, describing the fortifications uh, of the community and describing the population. And usually when the, uh, when the British, much like other Europeans, when they noted indigenous populations, they usually focused on the population of men capable of bearing arms. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are endless uh, debates among uh, scholars of uh, indigenous history that are fascinating to us and boring for everybody else about the proper ratio of quote warriors to, to non-fighting people to determine indigenous populations at a given place and time. And that's a very much an artifact of the records as Patrick talks about here about, well, this is about power, this is about using the land. Uh, and they didn't care about how many children live in Norwich Walk. They care about how many fighting age men do. Uh, so we have here, I'm gonna click on, okay. So this, uh, this document is a, an indenture. Uh, this is an indenture uh, by a, uh, a large landowner named Samuel Waldo, who uh, contracted uh, with, I'm gonna have to get back to my, my write-up screen here so I can, I can see what the, what the name was. Uh, by, uh, I believe the man's name is Yardley Lewis. Yardley Lewis. Um, and so Lewis is described in this document as a gentleman recently from Cork. Uh, and Waldo has leased 200 acres along the St. George's River for five shillings up front and one peppercorn per year afterwards. Uh, and Lewis had already been in the region and he promises within three months he'll build a good substantial log dwelling house of 40 foot long and 20 foot wide to be finished within six months casualties of war accepted um, and that he'll be uh, he will live it'll be it'll be occupied by him his tenants or servants with families for the term of three years and also the residents will within three years quote subdue uh, eight acres of the said granted lands okay uh, and so uh, many Ulster Scots and other colonists signed indentures like this one as part of their agreements uh, to obtain passage and possibly land. Uh, and so Tim, if we could start with you, could you, uh, indentures are maybe something less familiar to, to modern folks. Could you talk a bit about what an indenture agreement was in English common law uh, and how these documents worked uh, in the, the colonization and peopling of, of New England and other parts of the Americas? Oh, sure. I, I might say again, it is this, an aside and I, Patrick may correct me here, but the, the notion of Ireland uh, divided fiercely by sectarian um, contests, Catholic in the South, and Protestants in Ulster, um, that's a little bit later in Irish history. And there, there, were, there were quite a few Protestants in Cork. Some of them are a, a different migration of English Quakers that came to settle. I mean, uh, William, William Penn, for instance, and the Penn family had large, uh, large estates uh, in in Cork near Cork City, and it's so it's it's possible that this uh, man could have been an Irish Protestant drawn uh, because of that to the New World, but also of having roots in what we now think of Southern Ireland. But indentures were a form of a, fo uh, a formal and, and legal way for uh, young people to have a contractual relation with either an employer or even another family. 
in which for a number of uh, stated years, uh, depending on the age of the, uh, of the young person, they're usually young person, but sometimes they're mi migrants, they will labor, uh, perhaps uh, learn, learn a trade such as uh, 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 farming or but uh, also leather goods or butchery, whatever, there's a number of trades. They would do that for a number, number of years with the understanding that at the end of that period, <clears throat> they would uh, perhaps get a little bit of money and a, a certain status of being being trained. It was sort of, frankly, like industrial high schools in, 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 in Europe. It was a way of transitioning away from the family to um, uh, independence, economic uh, independence. And for families that had a large number of children that were a, an economic burden, frankly, to have, you know, it was a way of, um, uh, placing out these people uh, in 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 life, uh, much much like uh, 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 post high school teaching uh, experiences in in uh, our country, or it should work. Uh, it was both for men and young women, and it was uh, uh, primarily something that the young did. Now, some indentures uh, paid for the transportation to the new world in exchange um, for uh, five, six years of, uh, of, of labor. That was uh, uh, very typical in the middle colonies. But uh, these were enforceable in law. And um, that also says something that, uh, about the nature of the Briti British Empire and the, uh, uh, the rule of common law uh, as it spread as the, one of the faces of this uh, particular uh, imperial experience. Um, yeah, Patrick, would you like to? Yeah, let me just, uh, I think Tim, first off, as an aside anyway, he's exactly right when he talks about kind of when we think about Ireland, we think about the division between Protestant and Catholic, that is something that is really, for the most part, like, again, a 19th century phenomenon is the way that we imagine it. There was a lot more of kind of moving across boundaries and these were very permeable boundaries kind of in the 17th and into the 18th centuries and knew it. And the only time that these people would kind of, uh, if you will, kind of circle the wagons was kind of during times of great stress and during times usually of warfare. That's when kind of, if you will, sort of like the heightened sectarian divisions more or less really kind of coalesced and became and hardened and became what they would. A friend of mine is an Irish historian says, if you want to understand Ireland in like the 17th and 18th century, instead of thinking about it the way we normally would, think about the Sopranos. That's sort of like what it is. It's this kind of really world of kind of like of people moving in different sorts of ways and doing all their different kinds of things. And so that's, a, that's a, I think Tim is, has, has helped us with a very useful way of imagining what's going on. For the vast majority of those people coming over from Ireland in the 18th century, the kind of indentures they would have been serving, uh, would have been signing, and indenture is just a fancy word for contract, and exactly what Tim was saying. For most of them, anyway, going to the middle colonies, it would have been uh, an indenture to allow them to kind of sail over because they didn't have the money. Uh, as the century progresses, but particularly in 1740 and 1741, it's a terrible famine in Ireland. So the worst famine in the 18th century is 1740 and 41. It was a famine that wasn't as bad as the famous one in the 19th century. That's going to send so many Irish Catholics over. But it was really, really hard. It hit, it hit some areas very, very hard. And so it's going to be a massive movement of people. And at that point, the majority of people coming over from Ireland are going to come over by signing indentures. And that is like they didn't have the money to pay. And generally speaking, they would find their way to a port. They'd sign a contract. And they would sail over and then that contract would be sold in the new world to somebody who was going to be working as their master and they had to work a term of years and after that then they would become free to do what they wanted to do and so that's just a form of what we call bound labor that was really kind of a predominant thing in the 18th century and it would really kind of more well come to an end around the time of the american revolution this is an interesting indenture because this definitely echoes the kind of the plantation schemes that I was talking about earlier. So you know the things that this person has to do. And so his job is he has to recruit people to settle. And he has to recruit people to settle, to colonize an area, to subdue an area, as Ian was saying, to improve an area. And that's the only way that he makes good on the terms of his indenture. So he's got to go out, he's got to promote the area, and he's got to find people that are going to ultimately settle. So this is, if you will, a document about colonization. 
That's what it is, pure and simple. And you're going to be another one. There's going to be bigger indentures like this that are going to be formed, uh, that are going to be signed in, in North Carolina, particularly uh, by some promoters who are going to be inviting over lots of Irish people to come. And that's why, going back to what Tim said earlier on, a lot of these Irish are going to be invited to sort of like these difficult frontier regions because these promoters are saying, well, if I need a kind of people who can deal with the indigenous in the area, I know the people I want to turn to. The ones who had some experiences in Scotland and then in Ireland dealing with difficult peoples, bring them on over here. And so for a certain person like this here, this, uh, uh, this Lewis that you described, Ian, this is the sort of guy that would be looking ideally at the kind of people that we've been talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a good point. Uh, something else that we might uh, consider here and that I think uh, I'm glad that you guys put this in this Atlantic context because this is where uh, New England is a bit unusual. Of course, the, the locals would say clearly exceptional or better, but right, certainly uh, New England is unusual in that. Uh, so you have Waldo, by the way, was this very, he was a very large landowner. Uh, and unlike most of these uh, land companies, uh, he owned, he, he owed a controlling share in one of the large ones. Waldo didn't like to sell his land and break it into freeholds. Waldo liked to keep tenants, uh, and he would much rather recruit uh, Waldo more than any other large landowner, explicitly recruited from overseas, both Germans, Irish, Scotland proper, and he sent agents over to say, Maine is wonderful. It's just like Germany. You don't need to bring your winter coat. Um, everything is going to be great. Just come on over. Uh, so he got in trouble uh, for that. But he, he's recruiting these people over and he, he charged people extremely low rents, but he wanted tenants and he didn't want to break his land into, into freeholds. Um, and so in New England, uh, this kind of uh, a document was we see disproportionately these tenant uh, these agreements to be a tenant were generally signed by overseas colonizers whereas people coming over from massachusetts for example generally chose uh, or tried to become freeholders uh and so uh speaking of uh and so you know very very briefly folks right so if you own your land in freehold theoretically it's free and clear you own your own land you pay for it if you're a tenant obviously you're you're renting it out um but what might uh there are some other instances in early america where people chose to become tenants famously in, in the new york uh the hudson river valley what might somebody like yardley lewis get out of being a tenant what would the advantage for for various people be being a tenant, or or would they, or would you think most people would want to go shift over to freehold right away? Well, I, I I can't say what Lewis had in mind. He gave him status and certain legal personality that's important in this world, but I can assure you that wherever there were attempts to establish European landforms of tenancy or dependence, uh, that sort of thing, uh, the people uh, quickly rebelled against them. It was, uh, uh, it was not like, there was too much land in America and the desire for an independent freehold was as powerful a motivation for these people as you can possibly imagine. It propelled the settlement throughout American history it led, it led to some disasters and certain clashes with the indigenous people and ecological abuse. But the desire of these Ulster Irish, like the Germans who went to Pennsylvania in the back country, was to have a piece of land that was yours in freehold forever. That really yeah. is the story of colonial America, frankly. Yeah, I could agree. I'll just piggyback on that and say tenancy, like Tim was suggesting, is something that you did in the old world. It was not something you did in the new world. And so plantation documents may have worked well for a place like Ireland, for people coming from Scotland over to Ireland. That was the anticipation. And so you could kind of lease it for a certain, for a lifetime, for 31 years or something along these lines. And that was the way that it was done. But in America, and this goes back to exactly what Tim said, because of the availability of land, these older strictures were impossible to implement. 
And so the thing is, you're going to come as a tenant and you just go out further west and find some other land that you can more or less just kind of settle on your own, improve it, and then make a claim to some of that land. And the thing about ultimately is that these people who are establishing these settlements, they need human bodies. And so they need human bodies. There was a dearth of labor. And it's that simple relationship between land and labor. So you have kind of a labor rich old world with a land and a land poor old world with a with a land rich and labor poor new world that meant that ultimately it's literally a buyer's market when they get over to America. And so the idea that tenancy is something that really not can is not not, not can it's just something that can't exist. With the exception of Ian, as you were saying, for the most part, the Hudson River. So in parts of New York, the old patroon system with the Dutch, but that's the only place where you find that tenancy is going to have any purchase at all. The rest of these places, it's an impossibility. And I might add that even, even there in the Hudson River and parts of New Jersey is uh, the uh, major examples of riots and, and resistance and, and violence against, against the um, patrons or the patroons who wanted to establish a European landform. It just, it just didn't work. That's a good point. So uh, one of the, I'm going to switch us to another source, but I should add. So one of the reasons that I, I shared the indenture, besides the fact that we, uh, you know, it's it, for many of these uh, Ulster Scots, it was an important first stage in their arrival. But also, if you're in the main historical society, uh, there's not a lot of explicit references to uh, to Scots Irish Ulster Scots, however you want to call them, as such. Uh, and these are not a people who are well documented for, for a number of reasons. And in that, that doesn't make them exceptional. That makes them fairly ordinary, right? Most people in the, uh, before the modern world were just not particularly well documented. And so the only reason we have, so the, uh, of course, the town of, the missing town of Cork, so-called, is this exaggerated version of it. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but so we have this record of these people when they sign their indentures, their indentures, um, and then there's of course shipping manifestos. But we really, most ordinary people, only we have records of them uh, only in a few cases, right? So uh, everybody's born, and so they're they're born. Maybe they're baptized. Uh, they often get married. Uh, everybody dies, and often there's a record of that. Uh, but in other cases like that, we're looking for when they come into contact with literate authorities, right, everybody? And so in that case, for most ordinary people, many cases, that's when they don't want to, right? So if they break the law, uh, we sometimes hear from them or they're put on trial. Uh, another version, another instance that is maybe uh, less unpleasant for them, and so we're going to get to that, is this wonderful resource uh, that we have, and this is the uh, the town records. So, and this is a New England staple for for many historians. This is the Brunswick Town Book, and it's kept in. This made its way uh, the first few decades of the town book made its way into the Pajewska proprietor's records. And so, this is the cover of that very book, uh, which we have in our collections. Uh, and here is the. Uh, here's the inside of that book. The proprietors took it back uh, before the town of Brunswick was incorporated. And so the town book, the town book of records uh, exists in the company records when it was a creature of the company. Uh, and we get pages in it that look like uh, this, where they have records of in a town meeting uh, at Brunswick, September the 16th, 1719. Uh, we should add here that Brunswick was not incorporated. And so the town uh, existed, it didn't, it wasn't, even though the, the residents wrote at a legal town meeting, uh, that should be taken as a, a wish rather than as a full statement of fact in, in terms of how Massachusetts was, uh, was concerned. Uh, but so we're going to talk about a few of the, the passages in here. But first of all, hang on, I'm going to uh, zoom out here for a second. Uh, but if we could talk for a moment about what town books were. Uh, and so, Tim, you've, you've worked on uh, issues of matters New England history for, for much of your career. Uh, so what was the purpose of a town book in New England communities like Brunswick? 
Uh, what sorts of information was recorded there? What could we what could we get from it? Right. I, I might I might uh, I can speak to that. But as Patrick and I I know this this the Scots Irish. I mean, if ordinary people are generally under recorded, the Scots Irish are under recorded on turbo. I mean, um, it's yes. very very rare. Alas, I. I, in an earlier point in my career, I wanted to write, I was going to write about the great wagon road that goes down from Pennsylvania into Virginia. And it was the funnel in which Scots, Irish and Germans went to the back country. It was one of the great, the great roads of tra uh, transportation of migrants into the back country. We're talking uh, literally hundreds of thousands of, of people. And, um, the Germans recorded everything, what they grew, the number of cows and this. The Scots-Irish uh, always disappointed. I could find almost no what you would call reflective or internal um, documents about uh, what they were doing, their love or their whatever. Um, so it's been extremely difficult to reconstruct the world of the people we're talking about. It can be done, but it's 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 to me of all the different migrant groups. You think of the Huguenots, the Swedes, uh, the Germans. The, the, this 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 group is uh, the the most private and most most uh, secretive about their their internal uh, lives. But town books were basically the way that government government meetings, annual meetings, sometimes uh, where they recorded um, uh, important aspects of their ongoing uh, interface with the community and then I guess a government and the town books are are overwhelmingly concerned with land division of land the allocation of land the sale of land the building of roads so that you could get to uh, your fields the um, uh, crimes that you uh, a trespass against other people's land so really, I would call these primarily land books. When you get to the American Revolution, there's increasingly some political commentary about boycotts and other elements of protest. But, but traditionally, this is um, uh, about due, due process and clear title for the occupants of a landed place, a town. Mm. Thank you for that. And. Um... Before I get to Patrick, I should I should add this is that's a, a good point about the, the land and the, the official uh, records. And one of the things that I found, so speaking of where uh, many of our uh, our audience might be tuning in from, in what became the town of Port, uh, the city of Portland, Maine, um, one of the things that I learned while studying with with Tim was that New England town records were designed to give the appearance of consensus whenever possible. And so they hid all these conflicts that we as historians want them to open up about. And so if you look at Portland in the 1730s, they were tearing each other apart over the division of land and divisions between absentee proprietors and resident proprietors. And there were at certain points dueling sets of town records that were kind of passive aggressively arguing with each other, but they never counted votes. They never counted votes and they never said, oh, well, the Honorable Patrick Griffin respectfully disagrees and we got four votes fought for and eight against or anything like that. Almost never do you get that. And so instead, you're searching the sort of margins of these pages for signs of the, the conflicts that must have been going on here. Um, and so, Patrick, I've got a broad question for you and then a, a more narrow one. So first of all, uh, you've spent less time uh, traipsing about the, the New England records per se, uh, but I'm guessing that, you know, I know that in your past scholarship, sources like this provided you with critical details, even if that wasn't why these sources were created. Uh, and so what use might you make of a town book like the Brunswick Town Book, you know, when you're, when you're coming to a facility like the Maine Historical Society? Well, you know, it's, I'm going to get back to something that you said early on, and uh, because it's it's so true that normally speaking, and what Tim was saying is right too, is that these are really elusive people, and they're difficult to find in the records. And so, where do you run across them exactly? Ian, what you were saying before, when they break the law or do something that they shouldn't be doing, 
And so you could write a history of these people in the 18th century and think they're just a bunch of miscreants. It's all that they do. And if you read about them in newspapers, you would assume that that's necessarily going to be the case because that's the way many authorities view them. These people are just professional pains in the asses. Okay. And so you got to be very careful as an historian though. And that's means that these sorts of documents have to be tied together with other kinds of documents if you're going to do what Tim was saying to reconstruct a community, reconstruct a people. How do you do that? Well, you'd have to look at this and what you could pull from this is not only when they're breaking the laws and breaking rules, but also who do they live next door to? Who are kind of going to be some of their neighbors? And then you can look in other sorts of records, particularly church records, or if you're looking into things like uh, wills and things like that you can see who the neighbors were, who they trusted, and you can start to reconstruct the relationships of these places. And so as you look at a document like this, you have to juxtapose it with other kinds of things if you're going to get a three-dimensional view of what the community looks like. Otherwise, you could do exactly what you're saying, Ian, and that is kind of fall in the trap of thinking that these are people are nothing but lawbreakers. Because again, it's only when they run afoul of the law when they seem to be turning up. And so it really means that you have to do sort of exhaustive searches through di different kinds of documents. And only at that point can you actually figure out who these people were. And that's particularly the difficult thing about these people because there was a lot of bias against them in the 18th century. And because of that, we can't fall into those traps of just kind of write, writing the easy history of them. To do the more difficult work is the work of really, as I say, getting a three-dimensional view of who they were. And they were like any other people, good, bad, and ugly. That's the way that they were. And so to get an honest appraisal, you have to look at lots of different documents. And that's a good, I mean, that's a good watchword for doing the history of most, uh, you know, most people in human history who are not powerful or famous, uh, usually uh, a relatively rarefied group of, of usually men, uh, right? We just have to work all the harder to get a, a more a nuanced or well comprehensive picture as, as well as we can. And it is hard. That's why we have most histories are famous people because they're the ones where we, yeah, we know what King Henry thought about stuff and we usually have no idea what Yardley Lewis thought about anything, uh, you know, or to say nothing of his wife or children or servants or, or any enslaved people with him. Uh, so hmm. then uh, this, uh, Tim, so this, um, uh, this page in the, the town book deals with a controversy over uh, Reverend James Woodside. Uh, he was the minister that these, uh, that these people uh, brought with them uh, over to, uh, to the Brunswick area. Uh, and he became a source of dissatisfaction for the residents of Brunswick. Uh, and so... Um, if I could ask, so why, uh, why was deciding on a minister such an important decision and how might figures like Woodside become a source of controversy for 18th century communities like, like Brunswick and its neighbors? Well, these people were extremely uh, uh, sensitive to the nuances of uh, theology and they could, they could uh, uh, sniff out a, 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 a little whiff of dissent in, in theology like um, you, you never, you couldn't believe, but it was largely egos and personal uh, elements. Uh, the, the church, the Presbyterian congregation uh, was, was the identity of the community. It held these people together. It, it maintained memories. We're gonna, I hope we're going to move to memories because there's another wonderful source that opens up the world of the Scots-Irish in a way that I have found that other peoples in America don't have, but we'll get there. But um, the, the, the placement of churches, the location, can, 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 was it accessible and whatnot? Throughout New England, uh, one of the largest sources of um, controversy was when uh, farmers would uh, move out to the edge of towns, find new fields, and then come the Sabbath, and they'd say, well, why should I have to take my cart 10 miles and go to the center of the old town and, and hear a, a sermon? Why can't we have a church of our own? Whereas the original church would say, wait a minute, you're, the, so you're, you're giving money, the, you're supporting the minister, we can't have two, we can't have three. And that led to fierce fights all over New England, Presbyterians and Congregationalists. Um, 
and they were acrimonious. They very seldom led to violence, but they split families and uh, communities. Uh, you have to remember that in the period we're talking about, um, townships in New England um, are now uh, been divided into four or five towns. So when you look at a map today and see the little towns, five of them used to be the space of the original township. And so a transportation, even within your town to get to church uh, or a burial or a marriage, um, uh, as it became harder, just led to a uh, friction. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, one of my one of my favorite comments about a dissatisfied populace of a minister, uh, the neighboring town of North Yarmouth, which of course the good Mainers will know is just down the road from Brunswick, they uh, they they got rid of they voted and this was a Congregationalist community and they voted to remove the wonderfully named Ami Ruhama Cutter uh, for as the town book called it rank Arminianism. Uh, and so in layman's terms, he was too flexible on his issues of free will, everybody, and not hard enough on predestination. The town apparently didn't hold it against him and he was allowed to stay in town, but no longer as minister. Uh, and so we should add Woodside himself did not stay as minister past the, um, the conflict known as Dummer's War that happened in Maine from 1722 uh, to 1727 between uh, the colonists and the Wabanakis. Uh, and that, uh, that conflict also is a good segue into our, our, uh, one of our last documents before we take our intermission. Uh, and that is that these, uh, the, Scot the Ulster Scots were very much, as, as both Tim and, and Pat have pointed out, on the front lines of these conflicts with Native Americans. In the case of Maine, this was the Wabanakis. Uh, and so the, uh, these, uh, these people were, again, we have this, this contradiction here. They were both uh, people kind of sometimes fleeing violence and hard times uh, in their own homes. Uh, sometimes they were serving as colonizers and colonists in Ireland, and they went ahead and served as the shock troops of empire in Maine as well, very much often explicitly at the expense of the Wabanakis. And so the, the town of Cork is lost uh, as the historians call it, because um, the, the Massachusetts forces didn't do so well uh, in Dummer's War, and the Wabanakis burned the town of Brunswick as well as the town of York, or sorry, Cork, to the to the ground. Uh, but unlike Brunswick, Cork wasn't rebuilt, uh, and the Clark and Lake Company seems to have given up their efforts to colonize. Uh, anywhere but the very coastal portions of their claim, which had been, uh, was less contested by the Wabanakis. Uh, and so the people of Cork, some of them ended up at the St. George, uh, the St. George's River area. Uh, they, they were attracted by another ambitious official. His name was David Dunbar. Uh, and he was a, um, he's called, he was called an Irishman. Uh, he was an Irish Protestant. Uh, and he tried to build his own colony in sort of the mid coast region of Maine. And then, uh, sorry, this is the wrong document I've got here. I apologize, I'm skipping ahead. And then uh, he left uh, and then Samuel Waldo showed up in the region with his claim and said, oh, it's okay, you can come live with me, folks. And so some of these folks kind of hopscotched from one claim to another without much, uh, without much oversight or, or without much support from Massachusetts officials as they saw. So here we have a petition from some of the, and these names, many of them are Scots-Irish names on the, on the St. George River, to Waldo, Samuel Waldo himself, saying that, look, uh, we came over here, uh, we've been rattling around in this area since Dunbar, uh, and we, uh, the, the local Native Americans uh, keep telling us to get lost, uh, nobody will come out here and help us, uh, we have been, uh, you told us you had good claim to these lands, and, and yet, the, the, in this case, it was the Penobscot nation of the Wabanakis are, are nevertheless, uh, in this case, uh, the Penobscots came along, they appealed to Massachusetts, who sided with the Wabanakis, um, and then stood by 
while the Penobscots marched in and told some of these colonists uh, that they had to move their homes or they would be pulled to the ground or destroyed. Um, and so these people then wrote to, uh, these people then wrote to Waldo saying effectively, uh, please help us also what gifts uh, uh, in, this, in this particular document, uh, which we have in our collections at the Maine Historical Society. And so, um, this, uh, this thread we see here uh, in, the, in this course of events, uh, this remained a constant for the rest of the, the period of Maine history on the coast up through the Seven Years' War. These Scots-Irish colonists, Wallow kept bringing them in without asking the Wabanakis. The Wabanakis then uh, at, at various stages resorted to first asking nicely, uh, then uh, asking not so nicely, and then finally uh, to outright war, sometimes allying with the French, uh, and uh, in which then uh, the, the Scots-Irish colonizers bore the brunt often of the, of the attacks. And so uh, this, uh, this fits into a larger theme uh, in the history of Scots-Irish colonization, uh, you could argue, and that is, that is where uh, the Ulster Scots, uh, the colonists, uh, on the frontier tended to develop a hostility to elites uh, uh, with, uh, in the British colonies. Uh, and so I think we're gonna, we're gonna take a, uh, we're gonna take a brief intermission now because I don't want us to run over. So for people to kind of stretch their legs, but when we come back, I'd like to, to begin by talking about how this adversarial relationship that these backcountry Scots-Irish had with these often coastal elites, whether it was in Boston or whatever, what role that you found this having in the history of the American colonies, especially in the years leading up to the American Revolution? Uh, and what looking at these frontier tensions uh, can tell us about this wider trajectory of British imperial and then revolutionary history? Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take a, an intermission till 1105 for people to get their coffee. Uh, pet the cat, uh, you know, stretch the legs, whatever, uh, and then we will uh, we will come back at 11:05, and then also begin taking questions from the audience members as well. Okay. All right. So the we're back. Um, okay. So to uh, welcome back all to, to jump in on uh, a few big picture things and then we'll, we'll start uh, getting to audience questions as well. Uh, just also for anybody who was curious on that uh, petition to Waldo, uh, that was uh, the, that document, it wasn't in the Pajewska proprietors, it's in our, uh, the microfilms of the Henry Knox papers. Um, Volume 40, item 29, Petition of the St. George's Settlers to Samuel Waldo in 1738. Uh, Knox married one of Waldo's heirs. So there we have it. Okay. Uh, so the, um, get back to my, here we go. Okay. So uh, anyway, so the question was about the relationship between these, uh, this adversarial relationship that oftentimes uh, frontier or backcountry, as they called it, folk, uh, often Scots-Irish, developed with uh, elites like in Boston. Um, you know, some of it might be seem obvious, but if you could expand maybe on what the, the sources of that animosity were, and then how this shaped, uh, we'll start uh, at least the, the, the history of British imperialism before the American Revolution, and then we'll turn to the revolution itself. Uh, I'll let either one who's most enthusiastic. In, in, I, I'd like to um, uh, nicely and politely not answer your question. Um, <laughs> what, what, what I have found, and it was um, the most interesting element in my own research with the Scots-Irish in Northern New England, and that to me is um, Maine and New Hampshire, um, was not the town books or the birth and death records, although that's that's you know valuable, but an element that we introduced early on in the uh, program of memory, 
and memory being uh, replayed and creating uh, a sense of, of self, of, of, of maybe uh, identity. We might call it identity politics today. And that is, I found a group of town records, I mean, town history, largely published in the early 19th century that claim to be based on memories and oral, oral histories of the, the founders. And one of the elements I found most interesting was comparing these histories um, to those of Massachusetts and Connecticut. If you go to the record and the, the histories of, of a Massachusetts town, say Salem or uh, Lexington or Concord, the early history will almost always be um, narrated around the experience of a leading minister who has uh, become the, fir the first minister of the town and established the community. And around him are uh, richer folks, people that have, have land. But it's a, it's a basic of a Christian people in the wilderness um, settling. The record, the, the histories of Northern New England are strikingly different. Almost all of them have a central figure that's a warrior for the empire, not a minister. In fact, the ministers um, play secondary roles in these histories. And I, I would bring to the attention to all the people that are with us that the, the best document I have found is a brilliantly anthropological study that was published in 1851 by Edward Parker. And it's the history of Londonderry, New Hampshire. And it has some, uh, uh, some of these people had come over from Maine uh, via internal uh, migrations. But let me just read, if I may, um, something that is typical of these northern frontier warrior stories. And um, uh, the, 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 the man um, who is in, um, um, it, it was a man by the name of James Blair. Being at the time a frontier town and exposed to a foe in consequence with the war with the Eastern Indians, which broke out soon after the arrival of our people, there were two strong garrison houses. One of these was uh, manned by James Blair, a man of a giant stature and fearless courage who scorned thus to shelter himself from our enemies. He would never enter the garrison, but with his trusty arms remained without and alone. It was reported that this man who like Saul, the king of Israel, was from his shoulders and upwards higher than any of the other people. Now, <laughs> that's obviously a mythic rendering of James Blair, but in uh, towns in Maine, for instance, the history of Scarborough, I found records of Charles Payne and Richard Honeywell, and they're described very much like James Blair as courageous, feisty, violent protectors of their people on, on the empire, fighters, fighters for their people on the frontier. This is not something that you run into in any town in Southern New England. It is a distinct effort. <coughs> I might go on just quickly and say, that those of your listeners that uh, try to find Edward Parker's history, you'll find that the description of the Scots-Irish in New Hampshire and via Maine, um, unlike the Congregationalists, it seems that maybe the Scots-Irish li like liked, uh, uh, liked strong drink occasionally. I don't understand these people, but apparently, uh, and so he's, he gives wonderful, evocative reports that you can find nowhere else of what a Scots-Irish wedding and, of course, the famous Scots-Irish wake that often went for three days in which by the 
end of the third day, they had, um, as they would say, had spirited the dead onto heaven. Uh, so it is the, these peculiar sources that so I suppose some historians would say, well, what, what's a 19th century history have to tell us? Well, it turns out uh, an awful lot because um, it's, a, it's a form of, of honest oral history and the uh, playing out of memories that go all the way back to the siege of Derry, which is uh, one of the formative moments in these people's sense of self. Um, Pat, if I thank you, and I'm going to segue from that to one of our questions and then ask Patrick to kind of loop in everything together, because uh, I know he's also written extensively about some of this stuff. Uh, and so uh, we have one of our questions, uh, I think, is, is tied to one of the important sources of what the first minister in uh, it was then Falmouth, but became Portland. So we're talking about ministers, but then also this frontier you know, violence. And so somebody asked if we uh, about Reverend Thomas Smith uh, of, of Portland and how his history relates to the topics we've been discussing. Uh, he, uh, he's featured, uh, so he wrote a diary for like at least a quarter century, and it's a wonderful resource on, on um, Port, uh, Portland during the, the sort of the earliest really any remote kind of narrative history of Portland at the primary source from about 1725 to the 1750s. He's also notorious for he invested in scalp hunters where he subsidized uh, scalp hunters uh, who went out uh, to kill Wabanakis uh, and then to collect a, a province scalp bounty. And unlike most colonies, Maine scalp hunters, Maine wasn't the only, uh, Massachusetts wasn't the only place that had them, but they seem to be one of the only places where people routinely successfully collected on them. And that's been part of the exhibit um, on uh, Begin Again, uh, uh, our exhibit in the, the Maine Historical Society Museum uh, that everybody should go and see about uh, intolerance in Maine. And so I believe that that entry is, is featured in there. And so Smith was a man of God also investing in uh, sometimes women and children hunting expeditions because the scalp bounties covered men, women, and children. Smith himself, we should add though, he was Congregationalist and he wasn't Scots-Irish. And so lest we get reductionist and claim that everybody who was out there sort of fighting and, and committing atrocities on the frontier was somehow uh, Scots-Irish or something else. Uh, Smith was Harvard educated uh, and his diary uh, is most rich as a source for him sniffing his nose at his neighbors. So when he arrived, he described uh, what became Portland in 1725, as he said, the people there were mean animals, uh, he said. Uh, and who had uh, mostly soldiers living about the place who attracted others like themselves uh, to, to live amongst them. And Smith kind of sided with the more well-heeled members of his, uh, of his congregation of, uh, against his neighbors. So again, also lest we conflate issues of sort of, well, clearly it was these sort of great unwashed who, who did mean things to Native Americans and the Harvard educated people were, were sort of wringing their hands and saying, no, don't do that, right? But so that's where Smith fits in. So he's not a part of the sort of Scots-Irish story particular. If anything, I didn't find him saying anything about them. He's got a wonderful source. Uh, my guess would be he probably would have like other uh, Boston born or Harvard educated Native Massachusetts probably would have uh, turned up his nose at them and and and, and thought a, been a, uh, thought twice before attending a, a an Irish wake uh, or anything of that nature. Uh, but so that's a good segue into this this frontier violence, uh, which these these uh, these local figures uh, make a name for themselves. And the Hunnewells, as Tim points out, as being a, a major feature along Casco Bay in some of these histories. Uh, and yeah, some of the actual tales of their deeds as recorded in the 19th century seem like they could have been really apocryphal in terms of there's all kinds of folk legends about, well, there was a rock where all the Indians would gather before they fought and all kinds of things. Uh, but there's, there's clearly something to this violence. So Patrick, I wonder if you might expand on this. You also have looked extensively at Pennsylvania in particular and uh, the role of this 
uh, frontier violence is uh, prominently featuring these Scots Irish um, immigrants uh, and the uh, often Algonquin speaking Native Americans. And so how did this kind of often awkward relationship of the frontier immigrant colonizers, uh, sometimes the more uh, well healed metropolitan colonial officials in say Philadelphia and then the Native Americans. How did this, uh, how did this shape uh, the structure of kind of uh, colonial power struggles by the 1760s for the American Revolution in Maine and elsewhere? Could you weigh in on that? Sure, it's a great question. Um, it, it, we have to remember that these people, you know, going to kind of like the Eastern, heading out East into Maine or going to the back country in Pennsylvania, you know, or other kinds of these places, this is not the choice that wealthy people are going to make. These are the people who are kind of living on the margins, who don't have a lot to keep body and soul together. And they're finding themselves going out to necessarily these exposed locations. So there was a, uh, uh, an important official in Pennsylvania by the name of James Logan. As he put it at one point, he said, look, what we need is we need these brave defenders of Derry and Inniskillen. And Tim just talked about the siege of Derry. So going back to this mythic siege in the 1680s, early 1690s, we need these people who had kind of fought against the papists in the old world to serve as what, what Logan called, quote, a hedge against the Indians. And what he meant was a hedge against the Indians is how you, can you protect Eastern interests, how you can protect Eastern trade, those kinds of things. How can you expand the colony, but how can you do it on the cheap? And that's what these people were really doing. The state didn't have the power to do everything that it would have wanted to do. Wealthy people didn't have the power to extend territory further west into Native American lands. That was messy, awful, nest, uh, violent, and costly business. What you could do is you could send some of these settlers out here. Send the people who are the poorest, the people from the margins, and turn the necessity of their lives and of their marginality into the virtue of what you needed. And that's indeed what many of these people did. So what you find is basically colonialism on the cheap. And Ian used the term exactly, and I think you're right here too. These people are the shock troops. They were the shock troops of many of these colonies to kind of pushing the boundaries further to the West. The irony is, of course, is the minute that they found themselves inevitably in scraps with Native Americans, and they had terrible, terrible scraps. At that point, anyway, officials are saying, oh, these awful settlers that we set out, we can't believe the kinds of things. What a bunch of barbarians. And you said animals, these savages that we've brought over, look what they're doing to us, how they're compromising everything that we want to do. But ultimately, in the long term, it was in the best interests of so many people in the metropole, back in London, of the people who are in kind of the provincial centers of power to push those boundaries further out and to get rid of these Native American problems. That's the way that things were going to be um, ultimately prosperous for mm -hmm. everybody. But these people were the ones that were, again, they had this kind of mythic conception of who they were. And officials were delighted to tie into these mythic ideas of these people and say, to employ them on the frontier. The problem was, though, is once they got to the frontier, they had ideas of their own. And when they had ideas of their own, that necessarily led to more and more violence. And that is really kind of the history, I think, of frontier disturbances and how these people find themselves again between these two different worlds, betwixt and between the officials you know, who are saying, please, please, please don't kind of kill the Native Americans unless we're going to make a lot of money off of it. And between the Native Americans themselves who are kind of living further on the margins. I, um, Go Ian, ahead, Tim. I, Go ahead. I, 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 that it's absolutely um, on target. But as I, as I said earlier, in the histories of these settlements, you have these warrior figures that are um, heroic. But and came the revolution, these same people turned some of their sense of betrayal and victim and against the empire. And in your own state, I wrote about Samuel Thompson, who was in um, Brunswick, and he is lionized in the local histories as courageous, feisty, uncompromising. He wanted to start the revolution in, uh, you know, that led to the bombardment of Falmouth and uh, one of the first atrocities in the revolution. My point is that Samuel Thompson absolutely fits in to 150 years of Scots Irish history as, as, the, as the warrior hero that's standing up to external authority that is um, threatening 
the sovereignty of the local group. That's a good point. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to just point to a few places in our records people might go. There's, there's a, a, a page on the main memory network where it's a, a poem, or sorry, a song written down by a local scholar, and I'm really embarrassed. I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, it's John M. something or other, and if Jamie or somebody ends up messaging me, I'll tell everybody. But he was a, a local scholar uh, in the 19th century. And he, he interviewed a lot of people who had lived in, in Brunswick and, and Portland in the 18th century. Uh, and so he wrote down a song uh, that was supposedly about uh, this attack by a militia company on a group of Wabanakis who had just destroyed Brunswick in 1722. Um, and the song doesn't celebrate the bravery of the militia company. It instead commemorates that documented reality actually about how they came upon these Native Americans in their sleep and shot them while they slept and then ran away before they could wake up and do anything about it. And then the song even says, uh, some people said we killed a hundred, uh, some said it was even more, but as for me, I think we hardly killed a score. Uh, and then it even sings about, and then we ran away. Um, and it was this very, um, unsentimental in a way, this very unsentimental, uh, almost cynical uh, uh, memory and look at this frontier fighting where even uh, even even the descendants seem to have admitted that like there were a lot of atrocities that, that we that they committed uh, in in this fighting and they didn't they didn't seem to really try and hide them. Uh, one other uh, and that's on uh, you can see that document on the main memory network. Uh, and then finally, uh, we, the, the other local example we have that's in Maine is his name was David Cargill uh, and he and a militia company uh, ambushed and slaughtered a group of Penobscot uh, leaders and their family who were on the way home from a peace conference in 1755 at a place called Owlhead, Owl's Head Bay. Um, and it was, this massacre ended up dragging, it started the Penobscots joining the Seven Years' War against Maine. Uh, but a local militia officer in North Yarmouth, uh, and Cargill himself was, I'm almost positive, he was, Alan Taylor writes about him, he was Irish, Scots-Irish, uh, but a local militia officer on the frontier named Benjamin uh, Mogeridge, and he spelled his name eight different ways, he wrote a letter, and it's in our collections, uh, to one of his, supervi his, uh, his higher-up commanders, and he said, um, we hear about Cargill down in what he got at Owl's Head Bay. And we hear he got in trouble with that, but uh, we'd like to try and pull another Cargill. And we'd like to, I'd like permission to take my company out to see if we can't find a few straggling Indians uh, to bring them in dead or alive. Dead's easier, he says, to collect on the scalp bounties, just like Cargill did. Uh, and this was what the, you know, this militia captain in the, in the communities was saying, yes, we want to do that. And so by the 1750s, this, the attitude on the frontier was very much seemed to be that, you know, they were put upon, they didn't trust these distant uh, Bostonians to look out for them. They hated the Native Americans uh, who they believed were unfairly attacking them. Uh, and so they, they kind of vented and took out their, their frustrations on them. So they're, they're you know, so these, these frontier battles were far from glamorous. Uh, you know, these were not sort of set piece battles very much. These were often ambushes and even and massacres uh, that we find traces of in these in these records. And we should be clear out about them. Well, Ian, before, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little sensitive here as a, a Scots Irishman myself, uh, of, you know, that uh, would be how we'd be portrayed. But I, I'll, for the people in Maine, this takes uh, this man, Samuel Thompson, warrior. He wanted to start the revolution several months before there was, you know, Lexington. He was ready to go. This is the clay. He served with distinction during the revolution, and he was elected as one of the Massachusetts delegates to the Constitutional State Constitutional Convention because Maine was part of Massachusetts. Mm. And he went there, and someone said, you, you, Samuel, you and the Maine delegation should vote for the new constitution. It's a good thing. George Washington supports it. 
Yes. And he gave a speech before that, the state ratification. And he said, I love George Washington. I fight for him to the end of the earth. But I heard that he has slaves. He keeps slaves in dependence. And I could never vote for someone who, who keeps slaves. And therefore, he voted against the Constitution in the ratification. Next. So here you have these people that are violent on the frontier, but somehow, some way, and Samuel Thompson, he is Scots Irish, there's no question about it. He came to hate the institution of enslavement. Oh, yes. Uh, and I think that you raise a good point that, well, people in the past continue, well, all if you're not prepared to be surprised, you are not doing it right, you know, about people containing right. surprising multitudes. I want to mention a few sources we talked about here. I was getting a few messages uh, that I just want to acknowledge, and then we'll, uh, then we'll take some, some questions here. But I, I want to make pe sure people can find what they can. Uh, Jamie Rice kindly reminds me that the, so the Pajewska proprietors themselves, uh, the records are at the Maine Historical Society. Uh, but the, they're being digitized, so the records themselves are not going to be available just yet until 2022. Um, but the Parker's History, Tim, that you mentioned is available in print at the Maine Historical Society for That's people to, to ask for and check out, and a full text online at the Hoppy Trust. Uh, the uh, Colonel John Harmon was the militiaman who uh, led that attack in 1722. But the, the historian's name uh, that I'm looking on here, it was, uh, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, this was a, a record written 60 years after the incident. Uh, oh God, it was a local antiquarian, but his, uh, uh, the item, the, if anybody's looking for it, Colonel Harmon's attack on Somerset Point 1722 uh, is on Main Memory Network is where you can find that poem. And then this uh, local scholars, uh, McFierce, Mc, uh, I can never remember the guy's name. I'm, I'm mortified about this. Uh, it's terrible. It's one of those things that always slips, but it's probably because he didn't publish and he just kind of collected a bunch of stuff and kindly donated it to the society in the 19th century. But folks can find that on main memory net, uh, artifact number 25678. Okay, uh, so uh, just so that people uh, who, wanna, who wanna read more about this, Okay, so I wanted to ask, and we're going to get to the questions, but um, so Patrick and Tim, to carry this story forward to the American Revolution, uh, and so this, this dynamic, uh, especially of the, the Scots-Irish, uh, like Samuel Thompson, right, who, who uh, find, were often in the uh, sent to the less desirable lands and places, uh, often, uh, as, as Patrick points out, doing the dirty work of empire, uh, right, uh, but so then, um, does this then, how does this uh, carry over into the, the revolutionary era? Um, and so uh, does this, this experience as people on the in-between, uh, Patrick, does this, uh, I know that we're reluctant as historians to lump everybody together, but does this experience as people in between uh, lead to a, shape a sort of Scots-Irish immigrant experience and the choosing sides in the revolution or the American revolutionary struggle? Well, let me go back to something Tim said earlier, because I think it's a really helpful way of us of thinking about it. Imagine again that these people have a tape running in their heads and that they are on the kind of people, like all people, who are kind of liable to find certain patterns in the past and try to situate themselves in the present based upon those various patterns. If they're living in places along the frontier, kind of when the American Revolution breaks out, these people have been living kind of in states of warfare for a long period of time. So uh, even though kind of the American Revolution is not going to formally begin, what we would say something like 1775 or something along those lines, in frontier regions anyway, all the way from the beginning of the Seven Years' War through the end of the American Revolution, these people are dealing sometimes continually with unending conflict. It's sporadic conflict at times, but it's often unending. And getting back to Ian was saying sometimes too, it can be brutalizing in its violence. And uh, in these kinds of contexts anyway, it's very easy for the people to kind of fall back on, if you will, those kind of tapes that they have about who they are and what it represents. And it's very easy for them to, if you will, take one group 
and put it in the place of another. So at one point anyway, that the Catholics of old can be like the Indians that or the, you know, the indigenous peoples that we happen to be facing. Later on, it's going to be very easy for them to kind of put the, put the British in there. It's going to be very easy for them to see the British as they will. They will regard anyway the British almost as kind of like the papists of old. And it's very easy for them to kind of plug into this kind of like tape that they have and to run. And so these are very, very powerful templates for them to kind of understand uh, their worlds and to try to make sense of their worlds, particularly as the violence they're seeing around them is going to lead them to think that they are trapped again in this kind of old world with a new kind of enemy. So Tim was saying before, you know, at one point you're fighting the French and you're fighting the Indians. And then in the next step, you're fighting the British. How do you change these allegiances? And I think it has a great deal to do with these kinds of older tapes about how they kind of lock themselves into them. And this is, as I say, something that's extraordinarily powerful for them, particularly because the violence that they see around them is, is so constant and lasts for such a long period of time. Right. right. That's a good point. Tim, would you like to? Uh... No, I mean, what, I mean, I, I think that if anybody was going to write a history, of the Scots Irish, they, they they should take this this narrative that Pat articulated so so well. It is it is a memory, um, and I mean even even many many decades later, they evoke the memory of the siege of Derry. Your, your, maybe your people don't remember, but it was uh, when w w William became king, but James the uh, second still had. Um, uh, armed troops, uh, quite a formidable one. And um, the pr Protestants uh, found themselves in a fortified city of Derry. That's what we say, Derry, not London Derry. And uh, they were about to starve. They were eating cats and dogs. It was just the end. And then they were uh, liberated by uh, the Williamite uh, forces. It was seen obviously as providential and but that was a, a trope for their, their sense of history. They're they, they, they're 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 fighters for the empire. Uh, they're loyal. They're fierce. Um, but they're always always wary of betrayal by external author authorities. Um, I might might say as an aside that has nothing to do with your program except when William uh, relieved um, Derry. He said that any survivors would be free of taxation for their whole lives. And a couple of these people showed up in New Hampshire in the Scots-Irish settlements of Derry and Bedford down there and said, oh, I, I really, I'm really happy to be in America. By the way, I'm not <clears throat> going to be paying any taxes. And the locals said, wait, wait a minute, we, 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 we never heard that news. <laughs> and it was became their, their martyrdom became a source of local controversy. Excellent. Um, so there's a couple of questions uh, that I, I can answer kind of together uh, briefly by pointing people to a few sources. And I'm going to direct some at our distinguished panelists again. First of all, uh, Colonel David Dunbar uh, is a, a big topic of interest for, for some of you. Uh, I, I share your interest. He's kind of an enigmatic figure. And I, regrettably, there's not like a book about him that I'm, that I really know much about. Patrick, have you, uh, I can give a little bit, I don't know if Patrick, if you've encountered David Dunbar in any of your earlier journeys. Okay. So he was the Lieutenant Governor of New Hampshire. Uh, and, uh, if you want, uh, uh, probably the, the longest kind of narrative descriptions of him would just be in actually William Williamson's uh, History of Maine, uh, the two volume, uh, the 19th century work, which is very oftentimes really good for, for basic details. Uh, Tim always, uh, when we were studying, pointed out that uh, sometimes these 19th century histories were very careful. And as long as you're interested in the same thing that they are, you might find a very thorough uh, treatment of, of the of, of the facts, I'll, I'll, obviously not always. And so uh, Dunbar, I, I have very little to tell you about his roots, other than that he had a brother and that he was some kind of an Irish Protestant. Uh, but if you want to read more of the, he's most known for his feuds with Massachusetts Governor Jonathan Belcher, and there is some wonderfully um, petty 
back and forth correspondence between them over years. Most of it is in the Massachusetts Historical Society in the Jonathan Belcher letter books, which are on microfilm. Uh, you might actually laugh out loud at some of the passive aggressiveness that really needs its own kind of cinematic treatment in some of these things. If you think just because people are in wigs that they're going to be uh, extremely serious people, uh, you're, you're wrong. Uh, there's some of, uh, some of Belcher's correspondence with Dunbar. So Dunbar had to be Belcher's lieutenant governor and they hated each other. And Belcher spent years trying to get his underling to quit just by being mean to him. Uh, and so a mob beat up Dunbar at one point when he was trying to enforce the king's laws uh, and uh, Belcher didn't really try very hard to prosecute them because quite honestly, he wasn't that sad about it. Uh, but so Dunbar, to get to what somebody else was people was asking, he was trying to set up his own colony in, in mid Maine. Uh, there's other attempts about this. Uh, uh, Williamson writes a bit about them. If you wanna learn more, uh, come to our August 7th conference about the Bijevska proprietors where Alexander Montgomery is one of the go-to authorities for all of these Northern New England schemes, uh, which we will, we will cover them. But it's Northern New England in the Nova Scotia borderlands is a sort of giant field of dreams for all these wannabe uh, imperialists and colony makers. It, usually they wanna create a job for themselves. Uh, so they say, well, here's a colony that I can be in charge of. Okay. Um, so this is a, a question that we just got that I think is a good one for our, uh, oh, sorry, last thing. Um, somebody asked what role the Ulster Scots play in the dispute between the Bajeff Scott and other land companies. And the short answer is as pawns. Uh, they're just, they're there on the land and these companies fight over them and periodically sue the other person's colonists. Uh, and for more on the duel of lawsuits, uh, come to our conference on August 7th. It's going to be a four person round table. Uh, it's going to be a discussion about all the deeds and misdeeds of the speculators and the people they encountered, indigenous colonists, immigrants, everybody. Uh, so regarding the tapes that are playing in the heads of the past in memory. Uh, so uh, do the Scots-Irish see themselves as agents of conquest, uh, as victims, as something else altogether? Uh, are they, uh, in other words, are they proud of their valor or is this sort of a forced assignment that requires them to do, uh, to do this unwanted job? I'll say the answer is yes. <laughs> me and neither or, and that's exactly, I think, the tension that we've been trying to put our fingers on is to a certain extent that these people see themselves, we said, besieged, embattled in many kinds of ways, and that the, the, the dynamic that you pointed to goes right to the heart of the way that they would come to conceive of themselves. On the one hand, as we are the people, we're the ones who are striking out, we're doing the defending upon the margins of British North America. Uh, later on, we're defending the margins of kind of this new American state. Um, but at the same time, they will feel put upon and they will always feel unsupported. The idea is that we're doing the work that people are asking us or suggesting that we should do, we're not being given the support necessary to protect our lives, protect our families, protect our property. And these are the sorts of this kind of fix that they find themselves in again and again and again is really gonna to go to the heart of their sort of identity. So at the one hand, the idea that these people are kind of like proudly, proudly standing up for the values of a broader white society and these people are gonna regard themselves as kind of being white, that's for sure. But at the same time, the people that are ignored or marginalized or kind of, you know, um, uh, sent out on, on the very edges without the protection necessary for them to do the jobs. And that, that really speaks to the way that they're going to, to, if you will, kind of craft memory in the new world that can easily be kind of yoked to this kind of older sense of folk memory to the old world. I would, I, I would uh, agree, of course. Um, I've done a lot more research on Southern New Hampshire, Scots-Irish than Maine, but nevertheless, they're very similar. It's, and oftentimes they were uh, connected families. But when news of um, the Lexington Concord fight and then the coming of uh, Bunker Hill, the turnout of soldiers, volunteer soldiers, uh, not so much in organized um, militia units as in Massachusetts, but as 
interesting uh, as individuals from uh, Bedford, Derry, uh, Golf Town, these were Scots Irish settlements. Uh, the, the records of, of just people just putting down their plows and saying, I, this is it, this is the fight. Very, very typical reaction of these people, but this time the enemy is uh, Great Britain. Um, this is, uh, so uh, speaking of these, these narratives that people tell, so I wanted to ask you guys, I think it's important we should be charitable, of course, to, to other, other scholars and, and come before us and everything else, but we should also be, uh, we should also be careful of like essentializing narratives, right? And I think that the Scots-Irish are one of these groups of people who have attracted like a magnet, this sort of, this urge to essentialize them or caricaturize them, uh, and whether it's flattering or, or not, right? Um, and so uh, there's been various work on, on the Scots-Irish. And I'll just say one, I think one mischaracterization that we should just get out of the way. This is often used towards the Irish. They were never slaves. They had a bad time. They were indentured servants, but there were not as some of this cottage industry of usually uh, doing the agenda of some kind of uh, white nationalist work. There were not Irish slaves in the Caribbean or something like that. Just because they weren't slaves didn't mean they were happy or their life was good, but they also weren't slaves. Uh, but besides that, talking about the Scots-Irish uh, and, and thinking about these stories, is there any work, uh, work of history that you've noted or any works that maybe people should be mindful of maybe on the, that goes too far into crude essentialism, where it, it turns them into this essentializing uh, you know, clannish people, whether it's valorizing them or, or otherwise. Uh, but can you think of an example, uh, perhaps, that, that went too far or that is a, a, an example that we should be aware of and that we should be more mindful and comprehensive at our look at the sources? I could take a stab at that first. I don't think, I'm not going to point to a particular title, but I would say that sure. kind of, you can yoke this under the kind of the, the broad um, title of kind of the God's Frontiersman. And actually, there is a book that's titled that. Um, and there was a number of kind of popular histories that are kind of written that try to do, uh, if you will, kind of to turn the mythology into the kind of the history of these people. We've been very careful here about trying to disentangle the two and trying to say that the two are bound together and entangled in different kinds of ways. But that's the interesting story how the real history of these people becomes tied to the myth and how they create narratives of who they are based upon them. But that's, I think, the way that we have to view them. We have to say that this mythic conception of who they are, all right, is certainly bound into kind of what happened in the past, but it's their use of memory, as Tim was saying, over and over again, that is kind of really what the story is all about. And so if we have this notion, oh, we have these kind of people that were in Scotland who are kind of finding themselves in battle, and then providentially they go over to the north of Ireland where they got to take on the papists. And from there now they're going to do their foreordained work of clearing out the frontier of kind of indigenous peoples. That's the story of these people. The problem is, getting back to what Ian says, so that may be a nice story in the 19th century, and it's one that you can pat yourself on the back for, back, back about. But when it comes to the 21st century, not so much. That's one of the interesting things about it. But the past is kind of always much, much more complicated than that. And it's our job to kind of understand the context and understand what's really going on as we understand the way these people would use the tapes of the past to make sense of that. So that's what I would say when it comes to any books that kind of deal with the God's frontiersman kind of thing, or say that they're providentially oriented for the work that they're going to do in America, I generally think is kind of stuff to be avoided. And the stuff too, I would just say that tries to say the Scotch-Irish myth. That's it. As I said before, Scotch-Irish is a term. It's a 19th century American term. In the 18th century, these people were Irish. And that's the way that they were, would have called themselves and the way that they were regarded. But that in itself is a contested and interesting term that we as historians have to kind of, if you will, unpack and come to terms with. I, I, uh, that's, that's very, very good, very good advice. And I don't have any titles. Uh, most, that's true. Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't have asked me. people to name names. That's not no, necessary. No, well, I, 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 I probably don't know, but I, my, my general feeling that the literature on this subject is um, not very interesting or exciting. Uh, it's often partisan and it has to do with mythic qualities and eth ethnic pride and whatnot. It's, uh, it's uh, 
But I, I would say that my sense is that for a long time, the focus has been on the Scots-Irish as a people, as a group, on movement, all the things we're talking about. But I think more recently, the focus has is, is become more on the empire, on the power in London. And um, from that perspective, the, the story changes a little bit. Um, they're, they're violent, tough frontier people. That's not going to change. But like so many of the people, or peopling of the empire, whether they be Africans or Scots, Irish or other, they, 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 they were being used and exploited to advance the interest of the core uh, empire. And if you, if you look at, if you stand in London and look, look out at Maine and Virginia and the Caribbean and whatnot, their participation and their suffering takes on, I think, a slightly different hue. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I think we have a, a specific, uh, we have a specific question that maybe you guys can help us with. And that's, uh, so uh, somebody from the audience wondered, uh, it's, it's frequently said many Irish Catholics from the North converted and became Presbyterians on their voyage to America to avoid, avoid persecution. Uh, is there any data to support this claim or is that to uh, a story? Well, I've, I go no, ahead. Tim. Let, go, ahead. go ahead. I, I've heard that in 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 my own family. Um, there there are a lot of uh, Breens from Mayo, and uh, so my family uh, came came from Ireland um, out of uh, Belfast, and uh, um, they were they were hard nosed, take no prisoners Presbyterians. But uh, it was suggested that it might have been a a shipboard conversion, uh, and you know that that just doesn't wash for several reasons. Uh, one, it would have said, said that these migrants had an extraordinary kind of CNN knowledge of what was they were going to find in America. Second is, <laughs> one of the elements of these people is they're stubborn and feisty, and it was, it was bloody unlikely they were going to give up their religion so easy any more than the Catholics were going to I just said, I mean, that, 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 that's pretty much the, 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 co the core of the identity. So um, uh, to take a, take a pragmatic view that, it, you know, you just like sw switch your teams to, to fit the moment, uh, that, just, that, I, that doesn't wash. It generally happened in much, much more subtle ways. Uh, and Tim is exactly right. And so it wouldn't have been so much shipboard conversions as I think about how am I going to get ahead in this world? It normally happened when they were when they were in the new world. And it's very, very simple. Just imagine yourself that you happen to come from you were a Catholic who was coming over from Ireland. Uh, you found yourself in an Irish settlement. OK, the overwhelming majority of the people around you happen to be Protestant and there are no priests, no priests whatsoever anywhere. OK, and so then you have various things you need to do. You got to baptize kids. You know, you got other things that have to happen. It's just very easy for you just to kind of find your way over there in this very, very fluid world where people could cross boundaries. We think about this world, it gets back to Tim, what Tim said earlier on, of kind of Catholics versus Protestants. That's not the reality of it kind of in the period of time. Yes, Catholics hated Protestants and Protestants hated Catholics, but there was movement a kind of across these lines from time to time. And in the new world, if you didn't have priests and everything like that, it just is the way that it happened. This particularly, um, it's during the time of the Great Awakening, especially, okay, when you're going to find a number of people who are going to convert. And conversion isn't exactly the right term. It's just that people slip in to the other identity just because that's all there is around them. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, before I get to a, a final uh, sweeping question, uh, a sort of lightning round one, is there that you've found, uh, these are people who've moved seven, so often multiple times, is there a longing for home? Is there a memory of some kind of a, a golden past or like, well, things were really good back in the old country, whether that's in uh, Ulster or, or, the, or the lowlands or somewhere else, or are these people who are basically saying, no, we like it here in the Alleghenies, we like it here along Mary Meeting Bay. That you have that you have found in your I, I, I to a book that 
I want to write about the Scots-Irish coming down from Pennsylvania into Virginia and then across the Cumberland Gap into um, uh, Kentucky. Uh, and I have run across um, reconstructions of uh, certain festivals, as I said, in, in New Hampshire, the, you know, the, the, the typical Irish wakes and uh, elaborate weddings. But I have never once come across somebody who said, I wish I was in the old country, not once. No, nostalgic there. Even though we've talked a lot about, a great deal about how kind of what happened in the old world and their memories of it, the folk memories of it, uh, were going to define the ways that they saw things in the new world. They never nostalgically looked back and say, oh, to be back in beautiful green Ireland once again, wouldn't that be terrific? These people were in many ways, you know, they were forward looking, not only in terms of chronology, but also in terms of geography, looking for the next available kind of opportunity that they could take advantage of by moving someplace, going someplace, staying a step in ahead of authorities, officials of the law in some ways, because again, these are people who are living on the margins. People who are living on the margins really don't have, uh, they can't look backward in many ways. They have to look ahead in just that way. Uh, so thank you. So last question I have for, for both of you. So for your portable argument, right? Um, and so besides studying these, uh, these interesting uh, people for their own sake, uh, what can focusing on the Ulster Scots experience tell us about the workings of what scholars have called the Atlantic world in the, in the 18th century uh, that stands out to you? I'll let Patrick do that. Well, I think what it reminds us of, and this is the sort of thing we've been talking about a great deal, is these worlds are not just, or the Atlantic world is not just something that's created by officials sitting in London, sitting in Whitehall with kind of a map on the wall, thinking about what is this world going to look like and how we're going to control it. It's actually the very little people who kind of are living along the margins are the ones who are kind of, if you will, creating these maps getting back to what you were talking about earlier, Ian. So by looking at these people, it's a good reminder that even though these dramatic things are happening that are transforming the maps around them, it's these people who are actually doing that transforming. And these people also who are adapting themselves to make sense of the very changes that they're serving as midwives too. So to me, that's the fascinating thing about looking at these people in particular. They're like, the, as I said before, they're the poster children of all of this change, but they're a vivid reminder that history is being made by these kind of unwashed, unknown kinds of peoples, also just as much as the people who are kind of sitting in, in, in fancy uh, offices in London. Thank you. Uh, I would say I'm taking a, a slightly different tack in preparation for your invitation, which again, I, I appreciate and I commend you in doing a great job, Ian. But I found that um, the Ulster Hist History uh, Society in Maine claims uh, it has uh, either the first or the fourth most people that claim Scots-Irish heritage now in New Hampshire. Uh, it may be first. My point is um, I became curious and I don't have any answers, uh, not about history, but if, Patrick and I are correct about certain people replaying memories as time goes on. Uh, why should we assume it is stopped, especially in places that uh, have groups that still identify enough to form volunteer societies in their name? It may be that we're talking about a tradition that is still with us, and that would be very interesting to explore. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much to you both. Uh, thanks to everybody in the audience. Uh, and thanks so much to everybody who's a member of the Maine Historical Society for your support. Uh, the Historians Forum uh, aims every summer to provide you with cutting edge scholarship in an accessible format. 
uh, and so hopefully uh, that's the, the sort of that's the goal here and so hopefully you, you feel that we've achieved that uh, don't forget there's another free event like this in the morning this time it's going to be four uh, four people we're going to be uh, they're going to be talking about the Pajepska proprietors paper papers uh, and what can be done with them even more of them even more of these fascinating people even less uh, even less from me uh, if you uh, uh, if you want to hear from some of these other scholars, you can also check out uh, my podcast, the uh, Mainly History. Uh, it is uh, available on all platforms. It is not affiliated with the Maine Historical Society, so any complaints can be sent to me, although credit is due the Maine Historical Society for providing so, so, the, so much wonderful support and raw material. Uh, please do check in the comments for our um, for our, uh, please do check in the comments for our, our roster of upcoming events to register for, uh, exhibits that are now open that you're able to see at the museums. Uh, we hope that you, uh, you like what you, uh, you saw today and that you're encouraged to participate more and to, uh, to tell your friends. Thanks again, everybody, for attending. Thanks all. Enjoy your weekends. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye. Good seeing you.